Okay, and we're back, or welcome to another director's commentary because this is part two of my 10 days in Mexico. Now, if you haven't seen part one, make sure you go check out part one. And because I'm watching, you know what? I should just show you. And yes, I'm wearing pajamas. I wanted to be comfortable. Uh, I'm watching the version that we put out on the this, the Les Stroud 20th anniversary film collection. And when we did that for the 10 days, I, I'm remembering now that we didn't split it into two different episodes like it, the way it was released on television. We put the two episodes together so you saw the whole 10 day story if you sat and watched the film, which is what I'm doing. But that also meant that along the way, I forgot where we did the cut. Uh, so that I just probably bled into part two. So if you watch uh, Survivor Man Mexico part one and then there's a part two uh, complete with all of the um, intros and outros and credits and all of that. But if you get the 20th anniversary collection, 76 films, 20 years of my life making films, everything I'd ever done up until that point, uh, just before Wild Harvest actually, uh, then you would see the 10 day episodes, Norway and Mexico, fully from top to bottom without any break in the middle. Okay, enough of that explanation. Let's just get watching. And I'm sober this time. I, 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 I was sober for the last one too, for part one, but I was kind of on an empty stomach and had some scotch and wine. So I was, uh, how about lubricated? That's what I was. Directional light, whether it be ancient human activity or uh, coyotes or deer, okay, that was sheep, and the thing is the animals know where the water is. They got to drink too. Might have to weave my... Luke's probably going to cut that out, but that was really loud. I forgot I had the stereo on earlier today. I, was, I did a full workout, and I just came back in from a run with the dogs on a workout, and I always play my stereo when I work out, and I had it so loud. But you don't care about any of this. You just want to watch the show. Let's go. Way in and around cactuses and thick bush, but either way, I'm keeping myself on course. I'm heading straight for a sort of a very bright patch of hilltop in the distance there. If I just keep my eye on that and keep going straight forward, all the weaving and twisting I'm doing won't matter and I can just stay straight and on course. That sun is pretty hot overhead. I'm not sure how much farther I'll go. Some places on this planet can consume the living. The Arctic, the jungles, and the deserts rank supreme in this aspect. I gotta take a break. It's midday in the Mexican heat, and you can sure feel it. Oh, I gotta go check on that cigar, make sure it's still burning. It's been strapped to my pack. Whew! I was actually close. It's getting down. I think I'm gonna transfer. I think it's gotta be one of the uh, most unique methods of fire carrying I've ever done. All right, not sure how much further I gotta go, but I'll get the next one going. All right, I had it strapped onto the back of my pack, just sort of tied in a little spot, figuring the wind would keep it going, and it did, it worked well. But I think, uh, I don't wanna take any more chances. I think uh, I'll carry it from here on in. Well, I still got fire. Still got to be one of the coolest fire bundles ever. You can make them, of course, in many episodes. The Arizona episode, I make a, what I think is a pretty cool fire bundle. And I've done it in a few other episodes. I can't remember which ones. But having a cigar as your way for carrying fire from one location to another, it's pretty cool. Look at that old GoPro on my chest there. The problem with uh, holding on to the cigar as my fire carrier is I'm always putting it in my mouth and I actually think I'm burning it down a little quicker. It lasted longer when I just had it sort of strapped to my pack, believe it or not. Had it in a place where it wouldn't burn the pack. So I think I'll just hold on to it and hopefully it'll get me to where I'm going. Sun's beating down. I don't think I'll go too much farther though. So when I'm in my location scouting, <coughs> with uh, David Halliday, we sort of just checked out the island and different places and different locations in the island and, until at some point I said, okay, you know what, here's what I think I could do. I could do an ocean survival over there 
And then when I'm done with that, I'll, I looks like that's I can travel over to there in the mountains for the second half for the for the second five days. And that's often uh, the way I look at doing a Survivor Man location. And I've told the story before where you know several of my field producers, super well-meaning really tried hard to find me a location before I even landed on the ground somewhere, you know, that I would send them ahead of time, you know, uh, Jackie into the jungles of, of Amazon or uh, Dan Reynolds, who was an amazing field producer. They would always try hard and they could never do it. And it's not that they were, they knew what they were doing. They were excellent field producers, but it's a kind of a survival Zen thing that I go into. It's just like, okay, and I just look and I, you know, actually, this is going to be a good segue to what's coming up here. I let the land speak to me. I let the area speak to me. In certain places, just like I'm, I was like, ah, this doesn't feel right. I, yeah, technically, I could make it work. Technically, I could film a show here, but it doesn't feel right. And uh, I would use that everywhere. Uh, it, I mean, there were certainly a lot of locations where I didn't have that opportunity, and I was just dropped in. But once I was dropped in, I still had that option of, well, do I stay right here or do I move 200 yards or do I move, move a half a mile that way? Uh, and if it didn't feel right, I moved. I think I'm gonna call this home. There's a nice big tree here for shade. The next few hours, lots of firewood. And uh, my feet are really overheating, so I'd like to cool them down. Also, my cigar is starting to get really low and I only have one left. I'm gonna need it to get further in tomorrow. So, I'll get the fire going. I have to be home for tonight. <sighs> Biggest hazard here now is gonna be scorpions. Lots of them. They uh, mostly hide out in the barks of the trees, but they could be under these rocks too, so. There's also rattlesnakes. And here, it's a peculiar kind of, it's a rattlesnake without a rattle. Oh, what do we got here? And spiders. Ah, black widow spiders is the other concern. Lots of them here too. I don't know what all these spiders are, but uh, I'm gonna treat every single one of them as if it's a brown recluse or a black widow. Even in the dry, hot desert, proper preparation for fire starting is still vital to success. Probably only gonna get this one chance at a fire, so I gotta take my time and make sure I get it right. Yeah, I'm just wondering if... Uh... You know, there's a lot of times that I really underplayed the uh, poisonous creatures, the, the, um, the bigger mammals. Uh, it was on purpose. I, the networks used to, I mean, especially certain executive producers are like, oh, you got to show the stakes less. What are the stakes? We need to know the stakes. It was a big, it was like the catchphrase they would use. Well, what are the stakes? And they needed to hear all this things, all, all this verbiage about poisonous spiders and snakes and cougars or jaguars. And you can hear in my voice most of the time, I play it down or I will often offset it with something about how beautiful and how interesting they are because it's overplayed, uh, way overplayed. Um, it's not that there aren't poisonous creatures, it's not that there aren't dangerous uh, creatures and animals, but it's way overplayed. Ask anyone who spent a lot of time in the wilderness, they'll say the same thing. This bandana. Hey, there we go. 100% cotton. So my bandana is 100% cotton. That's a really good thing, because I'm going to make use of it. I'll just use enough so I can still wear it. What I want to do is I want to rough it up, break up the fibers so that it's somehow kind of fluffy. I've looked around the desert here and I'm just not seeing anything fluffy. Lots of pointy and prickly and stabby things, but nothing fluffy. And a big thing about that, you know, that I love to teach is it comes down to characteristics. Uh, what's the characteristics of the fire starter you need? Um, if you see something that is light and airy and fluffy, like uh, cattail fluff or milkweed fluff, it will probably take a spark and poof into flame, as will 
just about any other plant that has that kind of fluff. So you, you don't have to look for cattail or look for milkweed. You look for plants that have something fluffy. Now, I, I need something fuzzy and fluffy to get this fire going. There isn't any plants, but cotton's a natural fiber. So putting two and two together, uh, that's the idea here. Uh, and, and really, it's not that it's about the cotton. It's about the characteristic. And that characteristic for something to be able to take a coal and be blown into a flame is light and fluffy, like cattail. Yeah, there we go. Just breaking up these fibers nicely so I could pull them apart with my fingers if I wanted to. A lot of vultures flying overhead. That's not a good sign. I'll start off with this small piece, see if I can do it. Hopefully that'll do the trick. Let's keep all this small stuff right there and ready. Shove the cigar in, blow. And I think the beauty of this is I might be able to actually blow from the end of the cigar, from the, the non-lit end, to make this work. Hmm. It's gonna be tricky. It's always a matter of striking the right mixture of breeze or no breeze to get the coal to take, and finally, turn into a flame. Okay. <laughs> yeah! Oh, right little shot of wind at the right time, and poof! Off she goes. I got fire. Courtesy of my brand new patented fire carrier. Awesome. All right. Now that I've got the fire going, that's a huge bonus. Wait out the day, and uh, most importantly, start to conserve my energy, conserve my water that's in my body, try not to drink too much, because I don't have that much. And if I feel I can stomach it, I'll eat uh, some clams tonight. For now, I gotta wait out the heat of the day. Oh, that's better. With the fire lit now, I can save burning up any more of my cigar and keep it for more fire carrying tomorrow. This whole area here is uh, just rich in uh, artifacts. All the clam shells, they're brought here by humans and eaten. This is a campsite from the Siri Nation. Who knows how old? Hundreds of years, thousands of years. Uh, pottery shards everywhere. There's a piece right there. Look at that. It's got, uh, you can still see the burn on it from the fire hardening. It's a good sign for me that people have survived here before because I'm surviving here and it means that I'm on the right path, too. They would have always taken the path of least resistance, always camped in areas that were good for human beings. It's just what we do. Rich in history and rich in artifacts. I think, uh, you know, that's something that kind of never gets talked about, you know, it, not to go political or anything like that, but when you get into uh, concepts and conversations over um, indigenous land rights and, um, reconciliation and all of that, and I'm not getting into that right now. This is not the forum for that. But it's what I like to point out is, you know, sometimes almost mockingly, you know, I'll say, you know, in a situation, I'll say, okay, well, just, you know, how about um, give them um, Toronto? <laughs> and that it, it's a bit of a facetious, well, it is a facetious joke, <laughs> simply because the reservations and the places where so many First Nations uh, were shuffled off to were not the perfect places. They weren't nice places. Uh, they were, you know, they were awful in some, in, in many situations. And a lot of times now people are looking, you know, oh, well, where did this culture survive? Where did that culture survive? And they, oh, maybe off here in this deep, dark place. No, that's not where they'd be at all. Would you want to stay in that deep, dark place? No, you'd want to stay on the beaches you know, in New Jersey, that's where you would stay, where it's really beautiful and nice. Or, uh, like I say, if, if, it was, uh, if it was here in Canada, <clears throat> you'd be in the beautiful areas where all the plentiful fish are, where there aren't a lot of mosquitoes. So we have this image of the indigenous cultures, you know, struggling it in the depths of the woods. And some of them did, the Montagnier in northern Quebec did. But still, when they settled down, they settled in beautiful places. It's just that those beautiful places are now all, you know, victims, I suppose, of colonial, colonialization and our cities. Uh, those were, that's where the beautiful places were. So indigenous cultures were, they, they set up their camp on the shore of Lake Ontario, right where Toronto is, you know, uh, on the Ottawa River, where Ottawa is, and so on and so forth all across uh, North America. Um, the point to that 
little commentary is just that it's not the swampy, mosquito-infested, even though they look pristine and beautiful and in deep, dark, rich areas where uh, indigenous, cult cult indigenous cultures settled. Because you wouldn't settle there, I wouldn't settle there. It doesn't make any sense. Where would you settle? Some gorgeous place where there's plentiful fish and hunting. And that's where they originally were. Look at that, eh? You can sure tell a black widow web when you see it. It's just kind of gnarly and messy and in the front of a hole. Lots of them here. I can't be certain, but I, uh, I think that might be a black widow spider. Um, I don't recognize the red hourglass markings that you see in the classic sort of textbook version, but I'm in Mexico. That doesn't mean that that's not it. So interesting. It was a gnarly web, same sort of body shape and size and with the strange markings on the back of it. So could be. I'll have to check the textbooks when I get home. Maybe somebody who spots that spider can uh, go back and just <clears throat> press, press pause and uh, identify it and put that down in the, in the commentary below. I'd love to know what it is. Assuming I make it home. I've set up camp in the same area the Siri Indians did for a thousand years on their way into the mountains for survival. And in doing so, it always leaves me with a sense of awe. There we go. It's dinner time. Ah. Well, that's better than nothing. Like the Siri before me, I'll sleep out the night on the flats in the company of coyotes and under the stars of the ancestors, knowing that my quest will take me into the rocky crags of the mountain desert in search of any food sources, shelter, or water that I can find. So that last commentary right there, a little bit different for Survivor Man narration, wouldn't you say? Um, and it's interesting for me to hear that now because it was leading into where I was going to end up which was producing the series Beyond Survival and taking part in all kinds of earth ceremonies. Now, this is a good place to stop it because what I didn't say here was the experience, that, that, that little bit of commentary, the reason why I wrote it that way was because that night was the strangest night in a spiritual sense in many of my Survivor Man episodes. It really was something completely different for me. Um, I'll just tell you. I'll just tell you what I experienced, and you can judge me all the way, all as much as you want. Uh, I laid there, and it was. And and bear in mind, I had not yet done the Beyond Survival series and all of those ceremonies and stuff. I was. I had not yet gone and drank ayahuasca or San Pedro. I had not yet done any of these big initi initiation rites that I've done. None of that stuff. This is just me uh, carrying on with a Survivor Man thing in Mexico. And um, I'm laying on that ground. And, and I talked to David Halliday about it later. And I could just, it was like, it was like I could hear the voices of the mountains uh, kind of murmuring or calling to me. And sure, I was uh, operating on very little food. Uh, I was not drunk. The wine, the, if you watch part one, I have the story about the wine bottle that uh, was part of this. And that, the wine's long gone now. Um, but I laid there and uh, I, it kept me, I was up, I was awake, I was looking. I mean, it was very visceral. Uh, and it was, it was like, like the mountains were talking to me. I've never experienced, I had never experienced anything like that in my life. And when I talk with David Halliday about it later, you know, we talked just because it felt good. It wasn't a, a, a scary feeling or anything like that. It felt really good, but it was obvious to me. Like I was just like, wow. I think it's, it was like I can hear the voices of the mountains right now. And, and it was a good feeling. And Dave's commentary was, you know, you were camping on traditional. This is, this is not just any old Siri land. He, he came along later and, uh, and took a look at where I'd been and recognized it as uh, sacred Siri land. So maybe it's no surprise. Maybe the energies, I'll leave that for you to think about. And uh, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it for you to think about. But all I can say is, 
that's my story and I'm sticking to it, that's what I experienced. It was something pretty special and pretty powerful. And I should say as well, I mean, then when I went on to do the Beyond Survival series, that became a repeated refrain, if you will. So this was like very innocently experiencing something without even trying. And then later I was doing ceremonies to prompt those kinds of earth-connected experiences. Hey everyone, allow me to interrupt myself. I don't really like hawking merchandise and swag, but you guys do ask all the time where you can get certain items. For example, check this out, Hennessy Hammock. I put a lot of time and effort into designing this hammock with Hennessy. It's their top hammock. It's an amazing, beautiful, comfortable hammock to enjoy for all of your adventures out there. So just check it out. It's got a full size tarp, which is a big thing for me. It's got insulation and I love it. So I've got the Hennessy hammocks. Of course, for years I've been in a phenomenal relationship with Hella of Norway, Hella Knives. And this is our signature knife, of course, the Tamagami. These knives are handmade. In fact, I've been there to this very ancient factory where I don't know how long, how many, it's well over 100 years that they've been operating and every single handle is handmade. All of the grinding, everything is done by hand. And these knives are absolutely beautiful. I also now have a brand new relationship and you will see these items, new forging tools that I'm designing with LT Wright Knives out of Ohio. And also, Chef Paul Rogalski of Wild Harvest uh, has the signature Chef Paul Rogalski kitchen knife collection. Those are a big thrill to me to have these beautiful items that we spent years designing and I still have them available for you. However, if you wanna go more the route of just enjoying the Survivor Man legacy, if you will, then of course, go to my website, lestow.ca, go to the shop page, right there you've got everything. All the swag, all the merch, such as my manual on survival. This is if you wanna get into survival, this book is meant to be a way to walk you through step by step because I deal a lot more with concepts than I do with specifics because that's really important. Once you understand the concepts of fire by friction, uh, for example, you can do it depending on where you are because I can't give you the, the advice on how to do it here in Canada and hope that it's also gonna work down in the jungle. Things are different. So I've always been very proud of this book, Survive. So that is my survival manual. Also, if you weren't aware, I've got the book, Will to Live. I wrote this book to, well, it's kind of for a lot of fun. I took my 10 favorite survival stories, such as Chris McCandles Into the Wild or the Robertson family and the life raft, and I basically dissect them with this book. I, I, I tear apart the story, I go through everything, and I even give them a little bit of a grade on, and, on how I thought they did. So I really enjoyed writing this book. It's, it's a real easy read, it's a fast read, but I think there's a lot of insight there for you into all of these different examples of people who have either survived or perished. Speaking of books, so honored, so thrilled, so proud that Wild Outside, my first children's book, has won the Yellow Cedar Award, best nonfiction children's book in Canada for ages seven to 14. I tell stories from Survivor Man, lessons learned during those uh, expeditions and adventures, and there are even activities they can do in the out of doors. So there you go. My new book, my children's book, Wild Outside, Around the World with Survivor Man, has just won the Yellow Seed Award, and I'm up for another award yet. And in keeping with stuff that's going on right now, we are also up for an award for our season one recipe book from the series Wild Harvest. And if you've never caught the series Wild Harvest, check this out. Woohoo! Beautiful little rainbow. Dinner. This perhaps is the most incredible kitchen scenario I've ever had. When you start getting involved in local foraging and bringing the ingredients home and playing with them in the kitchen, can you create a dish where the domestic ingredients don't overshadow the wild ingredients? Hot, hey there. Oh! Go on! Now the job's getting fun. This dish is a showcase of how great these forged ingredients come together. It's the best when it's its own flavor. When you're making something with a wild edible, you're nailing it and not losing the wild flavor. Sometimes it is about the ingredients. Tell me that doesn't look awesome. Two seasons right now, 26 episodes. In the United States, it's on PBS stations. You can also get it on this YouTube channel. In Canada, Cottage Life TV. In Sweden and uh, 
Norway, on Macanalan. It's on National Geographic, Asia, which includes China and India. So my Wild Harvest series is playing around the world now. And we, with every single season, create a recipe book based on the recipes that we show you in the actual shows themselves. So that's Wild Harvest. And of course, if you want the DVD, you can get that on this website as well, lesjob.ca. And let's not forget too, that I'm a musician. CDs themselves are available on the website. The next release will be the re-release of the Mother Earth album on vinyl. But go on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you listen to music, or on my website, you can go to the shop page, you can pick up all of my CDs. So this is the last one. This is my 20th anniversary selection. Check it out. Every film I've ever made, 76 films in all, all of the Survivor Man, Bigfoot, Beyond Survival, music documentaries, one-off films such as the award-winning Lalash about the school shooting up in Canada and a healing canoe trip. This is my 20th anniversary, uh, 76 films. And people that have picked this up have raved about it. And I'm really proud that I can say I've got 20 years of anything, to be honest with you. That's available for you as well on that Les Stroud shop page. Okay, that's me hawking my stuff. Back to the video. Away we go. You know, being able to follow a trail is as much intuition as it is common sense. You just gotta really pay attention. I've been walking along here. There's a very, very slight indentation. It's just a gentle, you know, uh, one inch depression here, sculpted along this way here. And that's all I'm following. Sometimes that's all you need, just a little slight recognition of what looks like a place where people or animals would go. And when that happens, I always sort of project, well, where would I go? You know, where would the animals go? And this trail, whether animal or human, is definitely a trail. Now, if you come up here and check this out, look at, you see all these branches here, they're all broken off. They're broken off all evenly and in line and they're all broken and sort of flattened down on the trail as well. And it's all leading to where I want to go, so that's a good sign. You see that? So, pick out the trail. It's not always easy. Look, here it gets even better with trails. This is really hard to see, I'm sure, but there's actually a trail that, that comes up this way and another one that comes in that way, forming a Y or a V, depending on which way you want to look at it. And the Y, the stem of the Y, when trails come together, in the case of animals, almost always points to water. And it's because these animals are coming from throughout different areas, and they're all converging in on the same spot. And when I see a Y like that, it's going in that direction, and I see a pronounced trail along here, I know I'm still in the right direction. It's the way I'm heading. I think I remember that about this. I mentioned in, in part one that, you know, I had gone into doing the Mexico um, episode not in a very good headspace. Uh, emotionally, uh, I was, I, you know, just kind of making it happen, you know, getting it done. But I, as I'm watching this now, I'm realizing, you know, one of the ways that I kept it interesting for me and fun to do was throwing in all these little tips. I don't always get that opportunity with the story as it unfolds when I'm filming Survivor Man, but when I do have the opportunity to talk trail recognition, um, fuel gathering, things like that, uh, I, I just, I always loved it uh, because it was like, check, there's another tip I got in the show, check. And oftentimes, you know, at first it was thought, well, I already said that tip way back in episode 12 somewhere, you know. And it's like, I don't care, it doesn't matter. Not everybody sees all of the episodes. So repeating tips actually worked wonderfully for me. Um, also, when I would repeat a tip, it would, be, it would take on a different connotation because I'd be in a different location anyway. Without water, I'll dehydrate fast and be forced to do a march back out to the ocean coast to try to make small drinks of fresh water by using the water still I left behind. And that's one of the realities of Survivor Man, you know, showing the failures. Cigar went out on me, uh, and uh, <laughs> there was no way around it but to show you that. So, uh, and I was kind of like that. So, like, there you go. You see, I let my guard down. I wasn't paying attention to my fire bundle, and it went out. All right, whole new game now. There's lots of caves 
can spot them. All sorts of little caves along here. Good shelter from the sun. Don't need it from the rain, but just further up, there's reeds. And reeds are a good indication of water. I don't think I'll go any further. If there's water here, then here is where I'm going to stay. I see this. A canes like this grow for a reason. They need more water than the cactus or a lot of these shrubs around here. I'm going to check it out. All right. This is looking even better now. Well, actually, this looks pretty sludgy. It's not really water I'm going to want to drink just the way it is. But it's promising. So if this is like this here, then uh, I'm going to go up into the canes in the reeds and just dig and see if I can get some better, fresher water there. If not, I've got this uh, dripping source here. It's looking pretty slimy. I'm going to want to boil this water first. Let's go up into the canes themselves, see what I can find. This water comes from a very slow-moving natural spring within the earth itself. To drink it, I really should only take one option, and that's to boil it first to kill any parasites. That is, if I can get a fire going. The good news is that I'd scavenged a small metal bottle from the beach, so I at least do have something to boil water in. All right, that's a start. I honestly can't actually remember how I get this fire going. I don't know if I do a hand drill or a fire bow or what I do. Fire plow, maybe? Guess we'll find out. Huh. Well, what have we here? That is a fig tree. A fig tree is a softwood. Let me tell you what softwood is good for. Fire bows. There you go. I'll gather a few sticks to try my hand at fire by friction. I do see a cave just over there. I'm gonna go check out that cave. <laughs> Looks awesome. I can get out of the sun and it's close to some water. That sounds like a shelter location to me. Well, there's sheep poop in there, but I can clear that out. It's so rare that you get a good cave to have as a survival shelter. Most caves, I mean, oh, if I could just find a cave. Most of the time, caves are dank and damp and musty and, and um, terrible flooring, like there's nowhere to, to sit. It's uh, awful rocks and that sort of thing. This was just awesome. There's no question about it that these caves were probably used a thousand years ago by the Syrian Indians and, and uh, 500 years ago and 100 years ago. Um, there's no question about it because they just make it so much easier. When you can find a ready-made shelter, you don't have to make a shelter. And fortunately here, without there being any rain, just sleeping out, it has been easy so far while watching this episode. But a cave, it's just that extra layer of comfort and safety and security. Here's my view. Right. Let's try this. There we go. This is a shell I actually just brought from the ocean. I can put the spindle right up in here and I think I'll be able to hold it down. It'll be, it'll be my bearing block, basically. You can see the, the edge out there. Now normally, I always put my baseboard over top of my tinder bundle so that the coal's already in the tinder bundle and I go for it. The tradition here in the desert is that they don't. They, they always have a piece, uh, a little platform thing underneath that they catch the coal and then they transfer. I don't like that extra step. But uh, in honor of my desert friends, that's the way I'm going to do it. Oh, here comes the wind. So this is the problem. The wind starts blowing, you pick this up, and it blows off, and you've lost your ember. Let's give this a shot. Wish me luck. Everyone prefers different mixtures of wood for this. I happen to prefer using softwood spinning against softwood. I like how both grind down into a hot dust together rather than just one piece being hard and grinding the other one down. When I first get the smoke, it's not ready. That's just my signal to keep spinning and not stop until I'm either exhausted or I'm sure I have enough hot dust. Gotta come off it real careful. 
Here we go. Transfer. This is a small ember the size of the end of a cigarette. Drop it, knock it, or squeeze it too hard, and I risk destroying it and having to start all over again. So you saw, saw that little edit cut there. So, I mean, this takes time. So the editor is making it smooth so you can watch the process. You can see clearly how I did it, what I did, how I got it, and obviously I'm probably gonna blow it into flame here. At least I think I am. And yet there's, uh, I've mentioned in, in part one there, there's a dude out there who says everything I did was faked and you could tell by the editing that he didn't do it because you don't actually see the moment. When, it's like, you ever tried filming yourself doing a fire bow? in a survival situation, five days later into it with barely any food in your stomach and wind blow. Just the fact that you can get even it partially on film is, is lucky because there's no camera crew, fil camera crew filming me. So yeah, sometimes I didn't get it filmed perfectly, uh, but all times I, act, I did get the fire going. And this one, you can see what I did. It was pretty obvious there. So anyway, that's me snubbing my nose at that dude who, who uh, yeah who will not get mentioned again. It takes patience and skill to get a fire going without matches, but once you have the feel for it, you never lose it. It's like riding a bike, a bike that can save your life. <laughs> there we go. Whew. Touch and go. Uh, now that was really lucky because you know, it looked like I got it on just the first time trying the spinning. I've had other times where I've spent all day or even three days trying to get a fire bow going from the natural materials around me and not getting it going. It's really tough. Um, and of course, the very first episode I ever shot ever of Survivor Man, available on this channel, if you look for it, it's the pilot episode, it took me 11 hours. So, but this is Mexico, it's the desert, and it shows you when you've got all this dry material around you, how much easier it, easier it is to do fire by friction. This looks great. Ooh. Yeah, that is sweet. Why is that so exciting? Because that means purified water now. And that's how it's done. Right, home sweet home. Fire, water boiling, good protection from the sun and the heat of the day. Cave is probably by far, ah, you know, the, you know what that camera's doing right there? So that's me, double duty working it, that camera is getting a time lapse of the sun probably going past the rocks and the mountains, that sort of thing. And I would, I would set that up and I would just let it go and uh, on whatever setting to do time lapsing. So a lot of times when I was filming this, even though you know, I might have had you know, Max Atwood or somebody off getting beauty shots for me, I still went after beauty shots as well because for one thing, some of the beauty shots from where I was, uh, it, you, you can only get them if you're where I am and those guys were many, many miles away. So uh, I would do this and I would just keep it going, keep it rolling as long as I had enough battery power. And then that is what gets used as your transition scenes. The transitions in between scenes is that time lapse. Best survival shelter you can, you can find. You come across a cave, it's just, it's brilliant. It saves a lot of energy. And uh, the only thing about the fire in a cave is I'm keeping my fire just outside. Is the thing about heating up rocks a little too quickly, you know, they'll, you get the fractures and the rocks come down, and I don't want any of these rocks to come down on me. Okay. It boiled. Mmm. Mmm. Wow, that's good. First of all, it's good just to have boiled water. When you're out, in a situation like this, you go so long without anything that's ice cold or anything that's nice and steamy hot. So to get boiled water is already a godsend. But, mm, just to get water at all in a place like this is a big thing. But I'll go looking further tomorrow to see what else I can find. If there's water here and there's that much of it, there may be more if I go further up stream, so to speak. You start to get the dehydration headaches after a while. And they're never fun. I have fire and some water, but they won't be enough, and I'll need to keep moving to find a better, fresher, and larger supply of water. I'm also geographically too far away from a constant food source. It would seem somewhere in the middle might be the best option.
I've brought two of these from the ocean coast, and I'm gonna sacrifice one right now to help with my feet. Plant that uh, I gave the common name, the governess to, that I grabbed while I was on the trail, made it in with me here. I've still got it, so now's the time to use it. Helps to have a good sharp knife, that's for sure. This is already nicely bruised from being in my pocket. Uh, there's a use for a knife I bet you never saw before. Potholder. Oh, yeah. These blisters on my boots have been... Oh, my boots. These blisters on my feet. Yeah, I could use some more food. Uh, when I start talking in incomplete sentences and uh, not getting my thoughts together, I know I'm getting pretty hungry. These blisters on my feet have been... Uh... I feel like I look much younger then. Damn. Pretty bad, but... Uh... The salt and the sand and this ocean water helped a lot. Just the same, I can really increase the healing speed. So I'm just going to get it set and put my foot in it. Oh, that's hot. Wow. I added hot water to it. That's really hot on the foot. I'm going to let that soak for a while. And uh, as long as I can, I'll probably sit here for a good hour or so. With things finally starting to look up, I'll combat the boredom of being alone with some wilderness craftsmanship. Uh, I should mention that it's really pretty cool when I get to show wilderness medicines. I used the bladder rack on a burn in Tofino when I did Survivor Man and Son. I <clears throat> used um, uh, the smoking of a termite uh, mound to cure feet fungus in the, in the Amazon jungle. And for those of you who have not seen my new series, you got to watch Wild Harvest. It's on this channel. You just go into the playlist and find Wild Harvest. Uh, and um, we're doing, of course, as we're, you know, our, our normal local foraging. But I'm going to be moving the show into medicinals as well. So that's going to be pretty exciting. So if you're a Survivor Man fan, I'm pretty confident you will enjoy Wild Harvest. And try to make a simple cane flute. I guess I'm just not a flute maker. <sighs> That's much better. Eh. Dinner is served. Clams again. You can hear the coyotes in the background there. They were so loud, just chirping and screaming and yelling uh, all night long. It's a pretty cool sound. But I'm not going to complain. That's the last of my dinners. It's the last of my food. And as much as being out on the ocean coast is too far from a good source of water, being here in the mountains is too far from a constant food source. The estuary is a day's walk away. The best place for me to eventually be has clearly become somewhere in between the mountain water supply and the coastal food supply. Tomorrow, I'll climb the hills a bit in search of opportunities. And I think that's basically where the Siri were spending their time. They, 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 they needed to get their food on the coastline, but they needed to get the water up here into the mountains. So where I originally stayed, where I heard the voices of the mountains and all that pottery was, that's why they, the, the encampment was there, because it was the perfect place to be. Long ways up. Just gonna keep climbing and exploring. See what else I can find, as long as I can do it carefully. You don't just scale these things quickly and snap an ankle or go flying off it, because that turns a straight survival situation into a real emergency. Wow. Definitely gives me a better lay of the land. And there's where I came from. Way out there. That's my little cave, way, way down there. I 
know if you can see it, but there's another big, big pool of water down there. If this turns out to be good fresh water I don't need to boil, then I may have found the missing piece to this survival puzzle, a constant supply of fresh water. As this is enough water to keep me totally refreshed and even fill up my water bottles, and maybe then head back down to the coast where I know the food is. I gotta have a drink. One of the best ways to uh, get this water out of here is actually to uh, get one of those cane reeds and just drink with a straw out of it. The reason that I would drink out of a straw is because I can actually contaminate it with my own germs. So it's best to keep my, my human hands and face and lips and all that out of the water and let it stay fresh. I know the green sludge doesn't look good, but this is pretty much rain collection. It should be fine. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a green tinge to it, but... And am I taking a chance there? Yeah, of course I am. Uh, but dehydration is much more of a killer. I, I, I've had the conversation with lots of people on the trail, you know, uh, falling down, falling to, you know, prey to dehydration is such a quick killer. And there's a lot of times people will pass up perfectly good water because they're afraid to drink water from the wild. I actually use it as a bit of a, of a tradition for me, a way of connecting to land. If ever I'm in, a, in an area and there's a fresh flowing stream, uh, I'll, I'll often drink from it just so I feel connected to that land. You do, I don't know, I, I, it's not magic. Uh, but you do get a bit of an eye for water, and you just sort of, it's, it's not very scientific, but you kind of go with your gut instinct. Uh, and um, my understanding of the water that comes through the rocks and the rainwater that's collected here is that it's good, going to be good. That other place was clearly not. That's all right. That's going to be good. Woo! This is beautiful. Oh, it's cold and it's good. In spite of the disgusting looking green algae in the water, this rain catch puddle is quite safe to drink. The Siri Indians would have gathered water from these little pockets for hundreds of years. But I can't stay here. The food source is a day's walk away. The water is here. My place should be back on the flat of the land, straddling between the water and the food moving every day for a few hours to get what I need. Without a heavy pack on, it won't be a problem. Survival doesn't always mean sitting still in one place. All right, well, I figured out where the good water is, and I know where all the food is, out in the ocean. Best place to, is to be on the flat of the land. I mean, that's where the Siri used to camp, right in the middle. Come up here to get the water, go down to the ocean to get your food. And that's where I'm headed tonight. I'm going to camp out on the flat of the land, and tomorrow, a rescue boat should be waiting for me on the beach. That's survival on Tiburon Island, Mexico. And yeah, as, as I mentioned there, and once, once I'm doing that without a pack on my back, it's not that big of a deal. Now, that walk is just to get water and back again, only to get the water. I'm not carrying all my gear, which is, of course, in my case, it's also camera gear. Same thing going down to get clams or oysters or what have you on the beach. On the beach. Uh, I, I don't have a pack on my back, just what I need to carry in terms of gathering the food. So you can then cover a great distance uh, quite easily. You can travel in the dusk, in the morning, uh, in the, at night even, if you don't want to travel in the heat of the day. Uh, and that's what makes that center area so perfect. In a situation like this, you're setting yourself up for waters over there, foods over there. And, uh, and sometimes it might be, and firewoods over there. You know, And so finding a place to survive that you can spider web out to get your supplies is pretty cool. Oh, one more thing. <laughs> and this time, I am making the crew come all the way in here to get this camera. Throughout history, humans have struggled to achieve the three basic needs, food, water, and shelter. Today, modern societies employ trucks, trains, and planes that bring our basic needs right to our doorsteps. But it's not always like that, even in these modern times. In survival, victims have always needed skills and even intimate knowledge of the land to keep from perishing. Out here, you've got to fend and forage for yourself. 
As I've discovered here in the deserts of Mexico, food and water are not always neighbors. And so shelter must be built in between the two. And you've got to undertake a day's journey to eat or drink, but not in the same direction. The peoples of the land have known this since the beginning of human existence. It's a lesson we can't afford to ignore. Our own survival just may depend on it. Wow, 2012. 2012, yes, so that's, I, I mentioned in part one that I, I, I entered into this with a, not a good emotional state, 2012. 2008 is when, actually when my divorce happened, but 12 was, well, 2008 is when the split was, 12 was around when the divorce, legally speaking, was getting really heavy handed. And so I was in a rough place uh, and, uh, and part of me making that was also, you know, I needed to make the money as well and I never felt good. You know, if that's my motivation, I, it's always wrong. I never ever allow just making money to be the motivation for me to create anything in terms of my film work or my music or writing. Um, it has to be because I love the subject matter. I want to tell a great story. I want to inspire people. And um, now that I watched the Mexico episode, I know where I was at. Uh, and it's not that I phoned it in, but I did allow my skill sets to take over. But now that I watch it, I say, you know what? It's good. I actually like this, I like this one quite a bit. Uh, probably because for me as a survival geek, I got the chance to uh, show a lot of different skills. So, um, so that's it for this. Uh, I, most of you have already checked out or you're pulling off right now as far as watching this, but reminding you that this channel, go on the playlist and everything I've ever done is here on this channel. You go to the playlist, Beyond Survival, Survivor Mans, Director's Commentaries, uh, Wild Harvests, all kinds of extra stuff. Uh, and in addition, uh, if, you, yeah, if you think about it, go to my web website, lestroud.ca, grab yourself this 20th anniversary. Uh, Les Stroud, I don't know, Luke, you can put the artwork up there. Uh, uh, 76 films in all, this film included. Um, everything I'd ever done up until uh, just before our, uh, the pandemic, really. All right, guys, uh, that's it. This was, uh, this was fun. Uh, on to the next one. Uh, the next one I will do is going to be um, hmm, a real tough one. Uh, it's going to be Argentina. Yeah, Argentina's next. Pretty sure of it. That was a crazy ass one. That one, man, there's some behind the scenes stories for that one. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Ciao.